Thanksgiving bells. There you go. Well, there you go. Or you could just pull the sword out and slam it down, pull it out, slam it down. All right, are we ready? I am. All right, let's get uh, rolling here. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Gobble, 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 everybody. It oh. is Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that wow. just made the soundboard. First 20 seconds. <laughs> that Sorry, was pretty Matt. good, Matt. I like that. <laughs> Uh, it is Thanksgiving, and uh, as you prepare or are recovering from uh, gorging yourself on turkey and stuffing or dressing or uh, uh, pumpkin pie and mashed potatoes or sweet potato pie. Now you're making or, me hungry. I know. I know. Let's go to Thanksgiving dinner now. <laughs> um, we are here to help you put a little bit of a historical context into all of these things that you are doing, all these things that you are eating, and specifically... Or as Owen the Clapper says, pacifically, right, Owen? There you go. Um, what uh, 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 what Thanksgiving was like during the Civil War? And as always, and this is, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, is the last of the holiday X in this in the Civil War series with Matt Borders. Next year, we're going to start a new series with Matt, which is going to be just as exciting. Um, but uh, what? Holy days of obligation. That's right. That's right. Holy days. Of- <laughs> all, all the feast days. We're gonna do- <laughs> There's a Holy lot of them, folks. I'm going to be here every week. That's right. <laughs> Holy days of obligation in the Civil War. That's pretty good. Uh, no, so it's, well, we, were, we have an idea. That we're, we're not going to say just what yet because we want to make sure that we're actually going to do it. But anyway. So that's next year. We've got another series. But right now, this is the last one here. Uh, Matt, it has been quite a whirlwind year, whirlwind year with you. Um, we started with Christmas. We did. People loved it so much. I said, Matt, let's do another one. <laughs> and then we, uh, we picked Valentine's Day. Yep. Or as uh, our buddy Cam says, Valentine's Day. And uh, what after that? It oh, was. yeah, it's definitely an M there at the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then there was uh, St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day, Day yep. We didn't do Easter, though, did we? Uh, we addressed it, but it, we didn't spend a lot of time on it, correct? Right, because there was, like, no source material for it, wasn't there? Yeah. There, yeah. yeah. We, we talked a little bit about it, particularly, I think it came up during the St. Pat's one. Yeah, okay. That's all right. We can roll that into Holy Days of Obligation. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, 4th of July, I believe, was the mm-hmm. next one. Or was it, we didn't do Memorial Day, right? No. No. 4th of July was the next one. Uh, and Halloween was yep. the most recent. And now Thanksgiving. Yep. Doing the full tour. Yes, that is right. A tour de force and a tour de France. So here we go. Uh, Matt Borders, our favorite uh, historian to have on to talk about holidays, even though you're not a holiday historian. I am not. But uh, you were just so good at researching and I am so lazy. I said, why don't we have you do this? Uh, because I just, we'd never do it if it wasn't for you. So thank you very much. Oh, you're Round of applause for <laughs> Well, thank you guys. That's I appreciate Matt's it. next book. Yeah. <laughs> Holy <laughs> Days of Obligation in the Civil War. And the Holidays of the Civil War. Faces right. of Priests in the Civil War. Faces of Priests. <laughs> so who, who, uh, how do you, uh, manage to write a book, do your job, right. and research for this show, and your own show, The History Things Podcast with Pat McGuire? I put off the research for this until the very last minute. No, I'm joking. No, there you go. That's the spirit. <laughs> That's how I used to get AIDS on my papers in college. So. <laughs> now, uh, it, it's all about parsing it out, to be perfectly honest. The, the book deadlines and things tend to have longer. Um, you got more time to work exactly. on. Exactly. Yeah. I've got a longer time frame to work on it, stuff like that. So, And this doesn't take a huge amount of time it's just diving into the resource material gotcha Uh, as we discussed i think during the the first one the christmas episode when you're looking at these diaries and journals and things sometimes for the the more modern publications it's as easy as going back to the index do they reference thanksgiving no they don't all right let's check the dates nope they're not talking about it so move on move on yeah yeah Mm, okay well let's talk about that let's talk about thanksgiving Give us um, 
Just a general history, like a timeline. Do you happen to have a timeline? I do. Oh, I actually well, do have a Thanksgiving timeline. It's almost like we talked out, about this. Yeah, and pulling out uh, some of the big dates in Thanksgiving history um, as since the beginning. And most of us think of Thanksgiving and its beginning as 1621. Right. This, okay. this, is, uh, this is fascinating to me here. Yeah. And I think the people will like this. So there's actually one that's even older than that. Mm -hmm. National Park Service has been touching on this quite a bit. That's actually where I pulled it from. But uh, Francisco Vesco, uh, Vasquez de Coronado actually has some form of feast or a Thanksgiving of sorts with the Teja Indians in uh, Palo Duro Canyon, which is now Texas or wow. in Texas so in 1541. 1541. So 1541 is 80 perhaps years before the the, the first traditional Thanksgiving the first as Thanksgiving. we know it. Yep. So that's the first first Thanksgiving right. in Texas. Right. Well, there you go, Texas. <laughs> Good on you. <ya. laughs> <laughs> um, but I think this is great because we've looked at the the folks coming over to the Plymouth Colony or Massachusetts Bay Colony, things like that, and and the interactions between the Pilgrims and the Wapana uh, Indians. Um but this just expands the story. Yeah. Gets more people into it. Uh, these, these ties to the Spanish crown and, of course, uh, American Indians that were in the southwest at the time and their interactions with these folks that are just starting to come into the, quote, new world and really explore. And Coronado, of course, there's lots of issues with Coronado. Sure. Um, and that's a whole show in and of itself that would be completely uncivil war related. Right, 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 right. Uh, but... It's Not the least still, of which is the length of his name. Oh, that's true. It's too many that's syllables true. for me. You, you tend to see that with uh, <laughs> with these aristocrats. And yeah, things. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but it's it's still fascinating that we have these basically early forms of Thanksgiving, um, and we can expand the story to other groups and and bring everybody in because that's what we think of when we think of Thanksgiving. Right. We're bringing everybody to the table. Yes. Okay. And this just helps do that. Now, of course, 1621 is the one that is most famous here in the States, particularly on this side of the country, uh, the East Coast or closer to the East Coast. This is the Pilgrims and, and the Plymouth Colony there and what becomes Massachusetts. And what has happened is, is that the Pilgrims land in 1620 at Plymouth Rock. They go through a very, very difficult winter and darn near die. Mm -hmm. Okay, The Wampanoag Indians, um, or American Indians, excuse me, succeed in teaching these folks how to survive in the new world, how to deal with um, different climates, different ways of growing things, and they're able to survive because of these interactions. And so in 1621, at the end of the harvest season, they have a feast and what is basically seen as the first Thanksgiving. And of course, there's been many, many paintings over the years done of this, showing uh, the Wampanoag there, showing the men and the women in that classic pilgrim garb and all there and all that good stuff. And, and the variety of different what we now think of as pretty traditional Thanksgiving foods, be it the right. turkeys or the goose, uh, um, corn and potatoes, and at least early forms of potatoes, probably especially sweet potatoes at that point. But yeah, so a lot of our traditions go back to that one. But again, we can go even further back if we wanted to. Okay. Now, moving forward, though, into the colonial period and beyond, uh, 1777, all 13 colonies hold Thanksgiving celebrations. Now, something that I want you to keep in mind, Matt, when we're going through these, is that these are Thanksgiving celebrations right. and there's no set date yet. Uh -huh. Okay, And sometimes we'll even have multiple Thanksgivings in a year because the um, head of a colony or later the states would declare, hey, we've just gone through this rough event or this great thing just happened. So let's have a day uh, of feast or prayer or so Thanksgiving. So it wouldn't forth. be like in Massachusetts, every April 3rd is Massachusetts Thanksgiving Day. It could be the third one year because, you know, back in March, they survived some calamity or whatever. Exactly. And then the governor declared on the third, we're going to have a Thanksgiving, a feast of Thanksgiving. Right. Right. Okay. So it wasn't considered like an annual 
uh, state holiday or co- colonial holiday. Right. Right. Exactly. Okay, got it. And we will get into that during the Civil War. Uh-huh. So we're going to touch on that here in a moment. Um, one that your guests are probably, or excuse me, your listeners are probably quite familiar with is, of course, 1789. President George Washington declares November 26th a national day of Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. This is what's going to start this trend towards Thanksgiving celebrations being in the late fall, okay. Okay? Uh, particularly late November. That, so George sets the stage. Yes, he sets the stage in a lot of ways. Uh, 1815. President James Madison declares a national day of prayer and thanksgiving right there at the end of the War of 1812. 1827, Sarah Josepha Hale writes essays in the Boston Ladies Magazine calling for an annual national celebration of Thanksgiving. Now, she's the editor of that magazine. She is a very important lady to this whole development of the national holiday, and she's Mm -hmm. a pretty powerful lady, too, uh, because... Almost 20 years later, she's still at it. 1846, she is now the editor of Godey's Lady Book, which is the the ladies book is probably ha- the best known women's magazine in the country at the time. Okay. Like Red Book or something? Oh, something like yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. And she's calling for annual national celebrations of Thanksgiving. And so this is getting not only through New England and whatnot, but this is starting to get national attention right okay this is going down to the southern states going out to the western states things of that nature now let's do a a a dive into the civil war dates themselves all right yeah 1861 confederate president jefferson davis calls for a national day of fasting and humiliation on november 15th Mm, okay so jd trumps al exactly wow but he's not calling for a day of thanksgiving Mm, that's true his remarks specifically say a national day of fasting and humiliation so don't eat and then embarrass people (laughs) (laughs) well be humble before god is more likely (laughs) oh oh right 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 my bad Now, also in 1861, President Abraham Lincoln orders government offices closed for a local day of Thanksgiving, giving thanks for the loyal men then fighting for the country. Okay. Okay. And that's also um, not only in 61, but I believe that was later in the year, too. Now, 1862, President Lincoln calls for a day of Thanksgiving for victory in battle. So we're giving a reason, and he actually puts this forth in April of 1862. Okay. Okay. So we've had some victories there in the winter of 18, the early winter of 1862, and starting into the spring of 62, and Lincoln wants to basically get the word out, and hey, we're going to have a little celebration and uh, thanks for these events. Right. Also in 1862, Jefferson Davis calls for a day of humiliation and prayer for victory in battle on September 18th for victories in front of Richmond and Manassas. So Mm -hmm. the fighting that had occurred at the Seven Days and particularly Second Bull Run, the Confederacy is very pleased with how those went, obviously. Right. And so he's calling for a national day of of, um, prayer for His date was September 18th? Correct. Uh Uh-huh. Ouch. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Right. So word has probably not reached Richmond yet about what's gone down in Sharpsburg. You jumped the gun there, Jeff. Well, that does happen. Mm -hmm. Now, 1863, President Lincoln calls for a day of national Thanksgiving praise and prayer on August 6th for recent Union victories. And Matt, I actually printed out a copy of that, and I thought you might like to read at least part of that. Thank you, Matthew. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's see if I can read it in the dim light here. Now, therefore, be it known... That I do set apart Thursday, the sixth day of August next, to be observed as a day for national thanksgiving, praise, and prayer. And I invite the people of the United States to assemble on that occasion in their customary places of worship and in the forums approved by their own uh, consciences, consciences, render the homage due to the divine majesty for the things, excuse me, for the wonderful things he has done in the nation's behalf and invoke the influence of his Holy Spirit to subdue his anger 
I'm sorry, subdue the anger which has produced and so long sustained a needless and cruel rebellion to change the hearts of the insurgents, to guide the councils of the government with wisdom adequate to so great a national emergency, and to visit the tender care and consolation throughout the length and breadth of our land, all those who, through the vicissitudes of marches, voyages, battles, and uh, sieges, it's funny, I get vicissitudes, but I stumble on sieges. No, that was good. Uh, <laughs> have been brought to suffer in mind, body, or estate, and finally to lead the whole nation through the paths of repentance and submission to the divine will, back to the enjoyment of union and fraternal peace. Done in the city of Washington this 15th day of July in the year of our Lord, 1,863, and of the independence of the United States, the, what, I, it's cut off at the bottom Yeah, there. it's cut off at the bottom. I should, I should have just stopped while I was ahead. <laughs> well, I didn't highlight that section. <laughs> uh, I believe that is uh, 88th year of our independence. Ah, of course. Or 87th, four score seven. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You, you were close. Yeah. What's one year? <laughs> So, so that is a, uh, you know, it is uh, interesting to read that. That is uh, coming from the president. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because people, you know, presidents to, de to this day, you know, they have the prayer breakfast or whatever, right. and they say some holy sounding things and everything like that. But I, I don't, I might be wrong because I don't pay much attention anymore. But do presidents say things that um, pious? It depends <laughs> on the president. For Thanksgiving? For Thanksgiving. I mean, I know for Christmas they might and, you know, but but it's just very odd to hear. That sounds to me more like something that you would hear a minister or a priest say from the pulpit. Sure. Uh, than the president of the United States, according to the way we are today. And I think for today's language, that's probably true. But if we look at presidential proclamations, even today, they still say things like this in the year of our Lord, 2020, right. 2021, so forth and so yeah. on. Yeah. Um, so we're still using some of that language that we see here. What I found particularly interesting about this particular proclamation is the date that they're looking they're looking at. This was done 15th day of July, 1863. So Gettysburg has right. happened. Vicksburg has fallen. Um, Port, uh, Port Hudson has fallen. And so now the Mississippi flows unvexed to the sea, and the Tullahoma campaign is com uh, completed as well. We've had these hammer blows against the Confederacy, and Lincoln knows it. Mm -hmm. And so he wants to make it very clear to the country that, look, this is something to commemorate and celebrate. Okay, and So that's what he's doing there. But he's also hitting on many of the themes that we will see with the Gettysburg Address coming later that fall on November 19th, and also with the second inaugural, mm. okay? Finishing mm. out the war, but also looking to not only the man who has borne the battle, but his loved ones, uh, the orphan, the widow, that sort of thing. Yeah. These themes are reflected here, possibly for one of the first times, and we will see that just increasing with these later documents that he's even more famous for. Sure, yeah. It, it is uh, interesting to hear him talk about what, what's the term he uses uh, the enjoyment of uh, union and brotherhood or something like that. Let me see here. Major visit tender characters. It's somewhere in there, but it, whatever. If you find it, let me know. But what I'm saying is that it's interesting to to hear that. You know, Back to the enjoyment of union and fraternal peace. Fraternal peace. Yep. There you go. Um, it's just interesting to to hear the leader of a country at war uh, talk about uh, reunion and peace and enjoying it with former enemies in mm -hmm. that country. It's, um, it's very Christ-like almost, love your enemies, you know, that mm -hmm. type of whole thing. So it's, it's interesting to hear. Well, and that's the sort of language, too, that folks of this period, uh, mid-19th century, would really recognize, too. Sure. So um, it... It strikes me as appropriate, particularly for the day. We might uh, we might arch an eyebrow at that today mm -hmm. if we heard uh, the current president or any of the uh, the or presidents president, recently yeah. say that. But it's I think it's very common uh, for that era. Sure. Now you'll notice that he's calling for this day of Thanksgiving though on August sixth. So we actually have two. Union Thanksgiving holidays in 1863. Uh, the more famous of the two is, of course, uh, President Lincoln's proclamation calling for the last Thursday of November to be set aside as a day of thanksgiving and praise. 
Okay, so this is going to start the tradition of the fourth Thursday, Thursday in November. So, okay, so two the two in one year. Mm -hmm. Um, why? Why wasn't the first one good enough for him? Well, again, I think it it's because he wanted to acknowledge the series of victories that Union Arms had had uh -huh. at that point. Okay. okay. And then when it came around to the second one, that's a, that's establishing a national holiday. Okay. He'd had, of course, Mrs. Hale. Um, <laughs> Badgering's probably too strong of a word, but she's really been working this letter right. writing campaign yeah, for yeah. decades at this point. And she's really been pushing the Lincoln administration, uh, particularly when the war broke out, about having some sort of national holiday for the North to enjoy beyond the um, 4th of July or something like that. Okay. okay. So there has been this pressure campaign building against the Lincoln administration to establish Thanksgiving as a, we're doing this annually. Got it. Now, um, one of the things that folks like to point out about this, I just want to do a brief quote from the actual proclamation. And this comes out of the fourth paragraph. It says, I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and prayer to our benefit <clears throat> excuse me uh, beneficent beneficent thank you father <laughs> who has dwelt this, who this has like, dwelt in heaven this is like a tradition <laughs> <laughs> as i butcher a word or two you start a word and i know when you pause i'm like i know he doesn't know the word then i i somehow guess it <laughs> <laughs> hey that's okay if, as long as it's working um what's kind of interesting about this is that these very poetic prose while lincoln absolutely backs them he doesn't write this any idea who does uh does it write that mm -hmm. uh, hey close secretary of state william seward <sighs> okay i would have guessed it eventually if i just kept going down yeah absolutely names. yeah no but um this is it and when you look at seward's writings this is very much in his style but it was it was interesting to notice that and i just wanted to mention it because again it's a very evocative piece and moving and it's establishing a national holiday but lincoln doesn't actually write it okay yeah now in 1864 so a year later lincoln establishes the tradition of the last thursday in november by doing it again okay okay we declared it in 63 now we're actually doing it a year later mm -hmm. and so thanksgiving occurs um in the union states at the very least on the last thursday in november now let me ask you this mm -hmm. so when when the president declares these things mm -hmm. How, I mean, does the country respond overwhelmingly in the affirmative and do it? Or is it just kind of like how, you know, like, like Biden says, wear your masks and nobody does, <laughs> you know? It really depends on the situation. In okay. this, I think it, I think it was received fairly well. Now, we're going to see some quotes when we get into the guys in the field and stuff kind of grumbling about things, or I don't see what there is to be thankful for, <laughs> sure. that sort of stuff. That's all perspective. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, but the folks at home, uh, they're, they're looking for reasons to come together. They're looking for reason, not necessarily reasons to remember their loved ones in the field, but hey, this is a great excuse to spend a day or a day in prayer and right. and um fraternity with my na family and neighbors and stuff like that sure okay day off all right there you go <laughs> now in 1865 jefferson davis actually declares a national day of fasting humiliation and prayer with thanksgiving on march 10th 1865 mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> It's Richmond, a little has, close there. Richmond has less than a month to stand at yeah. this point. So it's right at the end. Uh, we do not see a lot of Thanksgiving proclamations coming out of the Confederacy over the four years of the f war. We also don't see a lot of Thanksgiving celebration or discussion going on in the Confederate states uh, over the course of the war either. And in fact, my quotes really reflect that. They, I, I could not find any uh, from Confederate troops. I think if he's going to do it at that point, he should have declared it a day of begging, pleading, and bargaining <laughs> instead of Thanksgiving because, uh, I mean, come on. He had to know that the, the end was nigh. Yeah. 
that there is that. But we're also talking about Jefferson Davis. He's a very proud man. And (laughs) (laughs) I don't think you're going to get too much uh, begging out of him, even later in the war when he is captured. We don't. Or when he's proudly wearing a dress. (laughs) Well. I love that story, but even I'm willing to admit he wasn't wearing a dress. He had had a shawl, a shawl thrown over him, but we can get yeah, into that. Yeah, yeah, that's later. another story. Yeah, but yes, the uh, the federal press takes that and runs with sure. it. Sure, it's a great they great little propaganda thing. <laughs> now, unfortunately, by 1865, around Thanksgiving, Lincoln is no longer with us. Right. So President Andrew Johnson recommends that the people of the United States, quote, observe the first Thursday of December next as a day of national thanksgiving to the creator of the universe for these great deliverances and blessings. Huh. I suspect it's because Lincoln has been assassinated and Johnson doesn't necessarily want to take Lincoln's holiday and utilize it. Got it. Yeah. That's just my just, suspicion. Just a, a, yeah. Yep. Now, I just want to, now that we're moving beyond the American Civil War, I've got a couple other points that I thought um, your listeners might be interested in. Uh, so kind of moving into the rest of the 1860s, 1866, Johnson's Thanksgiving proclamation moves the holiday back to the last Thursday in November. His 1867 Uh, Proclamation continues the last Thursday tradition, and he also will utilize it as almost a state of a union address. We really don't have a state of the union address at this point Mm -hmm. in American politics, and we're going to start seeing the Thanksgiving Day proclamation being used almost in that sense. Okay. okay, well, that makes sense, yeah. I guess. The, yeah. they, it's got a lot of pros about, hey, the country's coming back together, right. we're bouncing back, It's a, all of us are here, that sort of thing. Uh, 68, President Johnson again uses the Thanksgiving proclamation as a state of union, hinting at what became the 1868 General Amnesty or Christmas Amnesty, which I know you're familiar with. That's basically when he said, okay, all of you Confederates that have fled the country, come on back. Uh, You're not going to be persecuted. Um, And it unfortunately for um, especially the Reconstruction era, it reopens many of those former Confederates to then reenter politics. Right. Yep. And that leads to a lot of uh, fun for (laughs) the country. Now, by 1869, President Grant, Ulysses S. Grant, has, um, is now in office, and he will use the Thanksgiving proclamation as a State of the Union as well, but interestingly recommends the third Thursday in November. So many of us look at FDR as kind of playing with mm-hmm. the date, but Grant actually recommended the third Thursday as well. Um, it's interesting how, how these presidents jump around with mm-hmm. it. It is. It is. So let's... Um, Let's jump into the 20th century Okay, now. let's do that. Okay, and I've only got a couple for these. That's fine, but, you know, let's complete it. Right. Uh, 1920, the first Thanksgiving parade is held in Philadelphia. Okay? okay. So we think of Macy's Day Parade New and York. all these big parades. Yeah. New York, yeah. But, but Philly. Yep, Philly got okay. the first one. Philly did something right. <laughs> 1922, the National Football League plays its first games on Thanksgiving Day. Aha. Uh-huh. Yep. And Getting- now... Giving birth to the tradition of the Thanksgiving Day game. Exactly. And what, we've got three of them now or something like that? I lost count. I <laughs> stopped caring. Um, 1924, the first Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade is held in New York City. So just four years mm-hmm. after Philly there. Mm-hmm. Uh, 1934, the National Football League holds its... Um, that's interesting. That's it, it actually has two dates for its first game. So National Football League. I wonder if it's because we had multiple leagues in that era. Uh, but regardless, we've we've got potentially two different dates when they did their first game on Thanksgiving. Got so, it. Um, 1939, in a bid to help bolster retail sales with a longer holiday shopping season and to put an end to the Great Depression, Franklin Delano Roosevelt moves Thanksgiving to the third Thursday in November. And I okay. think most of us have heard that story and, and whatnot. Now, have, have you heard the, the Macy's connection to that? Shoot, go for it. All right. I think it is that uh, Roosevelt was buddies with the head of Macy's. I, I don't know if it actually was Macy at that time or not. Okay. And... Uh, Macy's like, uh, hey, Teddy. Oh, not Teddy, uh, Frank. Teddy? <laughs> Frankie, Frankie. Uh, listen, 
why don't you declare Thanksgiving the third Thursday and make it permanent? Mm. That way we get an extra week of Christmas shopping. Right. Have you heard this? I've I, Well, I knew that was the re- I didn't realize it was Macy's. Well, it, or it may could, have it, been. It, yeah, I don't know who it was. Bamberger or Petty. I don't know who the hell it was. But it was one of the, it was, I think it was Macy. Okay. I don't know if it was Macy himself or someone from Macy's. Sure. But I can totally see that happening. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and they did it. And so we have Thanksgiving when we have it so that you can spend more money at department stores. (laughs) Now, what's interesting is, is that in 41, 1941, uh, after altering the date of Thanksgiving, President Roosevelt reestablishes the fourth Thursday of November (laughs) as Thanksgiving Day. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. There you go. And then finally in... In 1947, and I'm sure there's other interesting uh, Thanksgiving dates after this, but I thought this one was funny. 1947, President Harry Truman pardons a turkey that is marked for the Thanksgiving dinner at the White House. So it's yes. the first pardoning, the first of, a pardoning of a turkey. Yeah. So then um, the uh, – but now – it's still the last day of, or the last Thursday of, uh, no, it isn't. What is it? I don't even know when it is. I thought it was. Is it? <laughs> yeah, I thought it was the it's last the Thursday. It's the Thursday before deer season. There you go. <laughs> that was JFK. JFK made that. Yeah, this year it's um, on the 25th, which is the last Thursday. The last Thursday. Yep. Okay, so it's back to the last Thursday. So maybe my Macy's thing is bull. Maybe I got that mixed, c- confused with something. It doesn't cool. matter. The Christmas music is already up. Oh, my God, I know. <laughs> I know. Well, Roosevelt definitely did shift it forward to try to put an end uh, to to increase shopping and try to put an end to the Great Depression. Well, that may so, be what it was, and maybe it it's not as nefarious me. as I made it sound. Uh, it wouldn't surprise yeah. me if it was suggested to him by one of the big retail stores. No, hey, well, yeah. and he doesn't keep it that long, which I found interesting. I didn't realize that it only well, maybe been. maybe Macy pissed him off. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, look, we're in a war now. Let's yeah. not screw with screw tradition. You. I don't care about shopping. Yeah, Eric, you know, you're you're right. The music is um is on. Usually they wait until Thanksgiving. Um Oh, not this year. Not this year. Not this no. Year. I've been hearing it and it makes me sick. Yeah. When it's 75 degrees outside, I don't really want to hear uh sleigh bells ring. Are you listening? Mariah Carey emerged from her burrow uh <laughs> promptly on November 1st this year. <laughs> well, that I don't mind. At least they waited Till after Halloween. That has always been my pet It won't be next year. No, no, no. (laughs) Next year it'll be Labor Day. (laughs) Labor Day. Oh, and the clapper, you wanted to say something? Next year your pumpkins are going to be red and green. I just have a question. Okay, go ahead. In your humble academic opinion, Mr. Mm -hmm. Borders, should people who put up Christmas decorations before Thanksgiving get human rights? (laughs) Look, I don't want to. I don't want to step on anybody's holiday traditions, but I know. I know in in my household growing up, it was definitely after Halloween, after yeah, Thanksgiving. After Thanksgiving. Yeah. But yeah, I, I have had friends and whatnot over the years who put up. Oh. Yeah, and was, and sometimes it's just hey, it's what you need right now. Our, ours was yeah. typically like the Friday after Thanksgiving or the Saturday because Dad was going to deer camp on Sunday and he was going to be gone Monday. <laughs> but it needed to be up. Sure. Well, there you go. There's a good reason for it. Uh, we had neighbors that put them up in like, like literally the like November first, right? And then they would stay up to like February twenty eighth. Wow. See, yeah. I'm guilty of leaving my Christmas tree up until like late January. Oh. Well, because I'm too lazy to take it down and drag it oh, out of my see, I, see, I thought you were going to go the Catholic route. No. Uh, no. Well, no, I couldn't even get past what is it, January 9th? Mm. Yeah, little Christmas. Yeah, yeah. No, they uh, they weren't lazy because this became an annual thing. They did it every year where they would leave the trees. And I'll the be honest with you. Up. If if I was decorating the outside of my house, I would definitely do that. I just wouldn't turn any of it on. Well, that's now my yeah. after, because it is freezing cold. Yes, <laughs> yes. In November. Yes, I don't want to be out there putting no. somewhere. My father's nodding up. sagely, <laughs> having mm. decorated just done an awesome job on the outside of our house for so many years. He's like uh, Clark he Griswold. Agreed. <laughs> Maybe house... not quite to that extent, but darn close some years, especially when we were little. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, when, when you're little, it's different because the kids get into it. Yeah. And uh, I used to like that. Um, uh, my, my nephew and my niece, they like the decorating and, mm-hmm. you know, they get all excited about Santa coming. Of and, course. Or, uh, or uh, uh, what's his name? Jack. 
What the hell's his name? Jack Frost? No, Jack uh, from uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. Skeleton. Oh, Skellington. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, that, was, that was a stretch. I wasn't even thinking that route. <laughs> My my Talk nephew loves or something. he loved that movie. What when Jack Skellington was, he, visits your your sister's house? No 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 no. I, he just he just loved that movie, The Nightmare Before Christmas, and I was surprised. I thought it would scare him, mm-hmm. you know. But he's twenty four. It shouldn't scare him at that age. <laughs> uh, oh, and you 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 don't have to keep moving the microphone. You could actually pull the chair up to the microphone or sit on the stool and kill yourself, and then just put the mic up at a comfortable level. And then when you want to speak, you speak. You understand that? Just to clarify, we're not advocating for you to speak. Owen to kill himself uh, so much as we're acknowledging the significant hazard that our, uh, Correct. The, our the, yeah, stools, stools present. Correct. We are not a uh, <laughs> modern high schooler that tells people to kill themselves. So, yeah. Yeah. All right, so go ahead, Matt. Where are we now? Where are we now? We're now into the section of uh, what other happenings in uh, the correct. Civil War. I thought we would dive in because we've kind of covered this with the other holidays. Like what else is going right. on? Right. Yes. Okay. Because there's like a this. war on. Yes. Uh, so I thought I would do a little bit with that. What other happenings are occurring? Um, November 28th, 1861 was Thanksgiving Day if we were to establish Thanksgiving by this point. Right. Uh, the Southern Congress officially admitted Missouri into the Confederacy. Okay, welcome, Missouri. <laughs> Federal authorities around Port Royal Sound are ordered to confiscate crops and to use local ins- the local enslaved population to prepare for the defenses of Port Royal ah, Sound as well. This uh, was, uh, was who? The Confederate troops or the... Uh, that was the, Union that troops. That was Union troops. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, the Southern Congress and admitting Missouri part is interesting because Missouri is one of those deeply divided border states yeah. where half of the state, particularly the Southern counties, uh, basically go, hey, we want to cede from the Union. And the rest of the state goes, no. No. So how did that work? <laughs> uh, basically, they have representation in the Confederate Congress, uh-huh. uh, both Kentucky and Missouri. That's why some Confederate flags have 13 stars on them, even though 11 states only officially ceded from the Union. Got it. Okay. So that's a little fun fact yeah. about the stars. <laughs> that is a fun fact. Um, now, in 1862, November 27th, President Lincoln meets with General Burnside at uh, Ambrose Burnside at Aquia Creek, Virginia. Burnside is proposing a direct assault across the Rappahannock. Uh-oh. President, <laughs> President Lincoln proposed a more complicated three-prong attack that General Burnside would reject. Oh. And, of course, we know what occurs there. So, yeah, That's right. Just a few weeks later at Fredericksburg. Fredericksburg. Yep. Uh, in addition, there was also skirmishing at Mill Creek, Tennessee, and in Carthage, Missouri. So now we're getting into the fighting. Uh-huh. In 1863, we have the siege of Chattanooga, Tennessee, had been broken the previous day, and now the pursuit of Braxton Bragg and his forces was on. Severe fighting will erupt at Chickamauga Station. Um We'll also have fighting at Peavine Valley, Pigeon Hill, Ringgold Gap, which is a really interesting battlefield, Uh and Graysville. So federal forces are now in pursuit of Bragg's troops. Uh, We're actually going to see some of the um, really competent officers in Bragg's command doing very well during this series of of, uh, fighting withdrawals. Uh Finally. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Now, in Virginia, so back to the Eastern Theater, on the Rapidan in Virginia, the Mine Run campaign is going to kick off on November 26th of 63. It opens between George Meade and Robert E. Lee, a campaign of marching and maneuver with limited fighting, as you guys are well aware. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then finally, we do have skirmishing also occurring in Woodson, Missouri, Brentsville, Virginia, Plymouth, and Warm Springs, North Carolina. So we've got fighting across got the board. Some fighting. Yeah. Nothing major, though. I would say those fights following up the uh, the breaking of the siege of Chattanooga are pretty significant. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Pat Claiborne and his boys oh, are, yeah. are fighting some pretty heavy withdrawing actions. Um, now, 1864, November 24th, federal forces beat the Confederate Army of Tennessee to Columbia, Tennessee, and drive back Confederate cavalry under Nathan Bedford Forrest. Federal troops take a uh, take up a strong position on the Duck River in preparation for the movement of John Bell Hood's Army of Tennessee as they're moving northward. Skirmishing also occurs at Campbellsville and Linville, Tennessee. Additional skirmishing occurred at St. Charles, Arkansas and Prince George Courthouse, Virginia, 
and Sherman continued to advance through Georgia with Confederate forces unable to determine his intentions. The quotes coming out of this particular era are, are very interesting. You've got guys like Hardy saying like, well, once we know where he's going and what he's going to do, we'll throw something in front of him. But Ooh. until that point, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> now, it is also on November 24th, 1864, that Lincoln's Attorney General Edwin or Edward Bates resigns. And he is going to be replaced on December 2nd, 1864, by James Speed, a uh, lifelong friend of Abraham Lincoln's. So that's what that's the news in the Civil War <laughs> on Thanksgiving <laughs> on Day. Thanksgiving. Uh, okay. So what did people uh, think of Thanksgiving in those days? The boys in the army, how did they how did they celebrate it? Did they celebrate it? And then what were their thoughts on it? Uh, food. That's food. the big thing. Think, yep. Thinking about food. They're thinking about food. They're thinking about the friends and family at home. Um, there's actually quite a bit in the newspapers about Thanksgiving, but it tends to be like we've seen with some of the other holiday episodes, a lot of looking at the, quote, history of it. So a lot of that hearkening back to Plymouth Rock and all that good stuff. Okay. We also have a lot of um, derision being thrown at the holiday coming out of Southern papers. Well, what are they? Yeah, okay. They're, they're, well, why? Why? They're, what are they saying? They're taking shots. Uh, for instance, we talked about are they the... they mad because they don't have food to eat? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's more of the uh, take the 1861 and two proclamations by Lincoln where it's like, hey, for victory in battle, they're like, oh, yeah? <laughs> oh yeah, what's happened since then, bud? Stuff like that. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's it's a lot of that sort of so, thing. So so in other words, there's derision towards the Union or the United States Correct. Thanksgiving. Yep. Not their own. Do they have their own? I mean, they. I mean, they do. Again, we've got the proclamations, but we really don't have this hard and fast holiday being set up. Okay. It's interesting. Yeah. Well, and it's also really interesting that all of the Confederate proclamations for Thanksgiving or like minded events are unfortunately um days of fasting right not feasts right and so that maybe it's because he realized they have no choice so let's just declare it a day of fasting and then it will be like no other day for them or you could read it that way absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah. <laughs> now it'll be like any other day is what i meant to say but <laughs> go ahead now, as we've done in the past, I have broken out a number of quotes from the troops in the field. I've tried to do a kind of a spread of different units and, and a few different uh, theaters of the war for each year of the war as well. And some of these are longer quotes and some of them are shorter, but um, I figure we can go through some of those if you so wish. Sure. So, and you're going to notice too that the dates are going to be jumping around again because sometimes they're able to celebrate them on the day of uh, some of the early war ones of course we don't have a set date yet mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing so when you do it uh, just remind us of what the declared date was that year right okay okay thanks so this comes from 1861 okay. there is no declared date yet uh for an official holiday we are going to have of course some of those proclamations but this is occurring in november of 1864 so uh, kind of hearkening back to washington's uh thanksgiving this is from first sergeant wyman s white of the second united states sharpshooters on november 24th 1861 in concord new hampshire so they're forming at this point it was thanksgiving day in new hampshire and the recruits took dinner in the phoenix hotel and in the afternoon took the physical examination and were mustered into the united states service for three years or during the war and this comes from the Civil War Diary of Wyman S. White. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're not even to the front yet. Okay, they're still mustering in. Now, just a couple days later, uh, First Lieutenant Abraham Cumbecker of the 32nd Ohio Infantry wrote on November 27th and 28th, 1861, from the summit of Cheat Mountain, Virginia. So the 32nd Ohio, they're in it. They've been fighting in what's now West Virginia or, or Western Virginia at the time. And this is a longer quote, so please do bear with. <clears throat> I almost forgot to tell you that we've had a pleasant time here on the 27th and 28th of last month. Colonel Ford prepared a dinner for Thanksgiving, which was the 28th ultimate. The Colonel had to leave on the 27th. Consequently, we had the dinner on the 27th. He had an excellent dinner for this region of the country. I will tell you that the leading I will tell you the leading dishes. We had roasted chicken, chicken pot pie, light bread potatoes, butter, 
stewed peaches, canned peaches, and a variety of other articles too numerous to mention. After dinner, we had the wine served, which was of pure um, catawba, uh, sent to the colonel from Mansfield, Ohio. The guests are too numerous to mention. On Thursday, the 28th, General Robert Milroy had a Thanksgiving dinner. The invited guests from our regiment were Major Hewitt, our chaplain, Mr. William Nickerson, and myself, as the old general is a personal friend of mine. We had an excellent dinner consisting of roasted venison and roasted geese and mm. so forth. After dinner, we had mm. some fine music. We had a gay time considering the fact that most important part of the party to make it interesting, the, the want of ladies. Mm. Yeah, that's tough. <laughs> but we expect when the war is over, we will have parties that will be attended by the ladies. And what's interesting is, is that he's writing this to the gal he winds up marrying. <laughs> Yeah, uh, what, 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 what was it with men back then writing stuff like that? Because Custer did that too. He would tell his wife about you know the ladies in New York or wherever he was. Right. I, I, I think it was almost a way to remind her that as beautiful as they are, I'm still only thinking of you and I'm faithful to you. It was like a weird way of of saying I'm being faithful to you. Mm -hmm. Look at all this temptation around me. Right. You know. But but okay so yeah that's a, that's a good point and we do yeah but we do look at some of these guys I mean Stuart he well known for loving female attention but as far as we know there was never any dalliances dalliances exactly mm -hmm. <laughs> he just enjoyed the company well sure who doesn't right um, if we move into 1862 I have a quote here from Sergeant George M Inglis of the 89th New York Infantry. Oh, and excuse me, that, that lengthy quote that I had comes from actually a, um, a website that transcribes letters. Mm. Uh, it's a very interesting website. What's the name? Uh, called Spared and Shared. Spared and Shared. Yep. Dot com? I believe it is a dot com. If All I right, right, very good. Yep. So, yeah, I highly recommend folks check that out. November 27th, 1862, in front of Fredericksburg, Virginia. Let's see. We have been at work carrying boards and commencing a house. It is Thanksgiving. How do I have, how I would have liked to have been home? And this is from the book, This from George, which is a collection, a collection of his letters. So really not getting into partying, not getting into feasting. He's just thinking about home. Mm -hmm. And in this case, they're prepping for winter quarters. But of course, we know they've got one more nasty fight to deal with right. before that happens. Right, right. Yeah. Another gentleman who's in the field that winter is Second Lieutenant Elijah Hunt Rhodes, Second Rhode Island Infantry. I've heard of him? Oh yes, <laughs> we've mentioned him a few times. Yeah, um, writes a lot. Do it, do it in that New England accent that uh, they do in Ken Burns. <laughs> oh no! I'm oh not, come on, I'm do not, it. I'm not. God, what would a Rhode Island accent? Be? I don't know, but the guy you know, do the accent the guy does in in it's like Ken Peter Burns. Griffin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Here, <laughs> okay. let me try it. Go for it. Where is it? Right there. Okay. All right, so second lieutenant Elijah Hunt Rose. Uh, all right, well, let's see. Uh, the guy in, in uh, Ken Burns says something like, Thanksgiving Day in Rhode Island. There you go. Well, I too have... No, see, but that that's not the way. <laughs> now I'm doing Peter Griffin. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing Peter well, Griffin as like a 1930s radio person. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have too much to be, thank to be thankful... What? I have too much to thank my heavenly father for. <clears throat> He has preserved my life and given me health and strength to do my duty. <laughs> for all which I have devoutly, for all, all for, for all which I am devoutly grateful. All for the union. All right, let's, Thanksgiving Day in Rhode Island. <laughs> well, I too have much to be thankful. See, it's. Did you copy this over, or was this like? No, oh, that's a direct. Okay, it's copy and pasted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So they didn't do a good job. <laughs> I too have much to be. Thank my heavenly father for. They missed a two in there. I think so. Yep. Or thankful or whatever. But anyway, uh, yeah, thankful to my heavenly father for. He has uh, preserved my life and given me health and strength to do my duty for all which I am devoutly grateful. And that's from All for the Union there. Sorry. No, nope, that's Didn't fine. Didn't mean to mangle that. That's a, no, that's a great resource, though. All for the Union, I highly recommend. Elijah Hunt Rhodes. Elijah, Elijah Hunt Rhodes. Elijah. Second Rhode Island Infantry. <laughs> you are dark. All right, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> you, go, you okay? <laughs> Live on air, Matt has a stroke. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, 
Now, this next one actually comes from the 9th Vermont Infantry, and we see them quite a bit in the Maryland campaign, particularly the fighting down there um, near the fighting around, excuse me, not near, uh, around Harper's Ferry. But this is Captain Edward Hastings Ripley, 9th Vermont Infantry. Up December 10th, 1862, in Camp Douglas, Chicago, Illinois. Mm. Mm, why are we there? Mm, were they captured? They were. Oh. Yep, they're part of the garrison. Mm. Um, and I actually quote him in, the, in my book, too. We are in the midst of festivities following the receipt of our big box. And... Again, we talked about boxes. Oh, yeah, 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 know. yeah. Packages from home and yep. stuff. Yep. We have been eating, drinking, and very merry since we unpacked it. And this is from Vermont General, The Unusual Experiences of Edward Hastings Ripley in the, in the American Civil War. So he's getting food from home. He's getting food from home. He's uh, he's there with his men in Chicago. They're in a not in a dangerous situation, even though they can't go anywhere because the garrison of Harper's Ferry is captured and mm-hmm. paroled, mm-hmm. Uh, which means they have to sit out the war until they are notified that they have been properly exchanged for a Confederate prisoner. I really, that never, no matter how many times people explain it to me, mm-hmm. will ever make sense to me that people did that now pat pat can't wrap his head around it either i, I mean the the I, I guess that means me and pat have no honor because because <laughs> i i wouldn't go that far for either of you well i mean if i'm in a war i'm gonna sit it out and wait until i'm exchanged it's ridiculous and then on top of that i'm in my own country's prison camp right and you're being guarded and i'm being guarded yep now, what's interesting with the ninth and some of the Wait, other... Wait, how do you just move on from that, Matthew? Doesn't that sound <laughs> ridiculous to you? To be perfectly honest, no. Because of the sensibilities of the time and you understand them. Yeah. And we see this a lot, not only during the American Civil War, but we see this in wars coming up to this. So, oh, yeah. Don't get me started on the ridiculousness of the Revolutionary War and all right. that stuff and all that crap. Yeah. Yeah. So, parole... Yes, by our modern sensibilities, paroling enemy forces doesn't make any sense because they'd go right back into the opposing force. Yeah. Now, the Lincoln administration in late 63 and into 64 agrees with that mindset. They're like, look, every time we capture these guys, they wind up in the <laughs> back in the army again, so we're going to begin to hold them. And that's sure. when the um, exchange system, the unofficial exchange system between the armies, between the opposing sides, breaks down. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, Grant, when he becomes general in chief, and I, I apologize, I'm going far afield now, mm-hmm. but when right. Grant becomes general in chief of the armies in the winter of '64, he would agree with the Lincoln administration's decision to stop the exchange system. Also, because the Confederacy is the Confederacy is not exchanging United States colored troops. Right. Okay. Right. And that's a big one. Lincoln sure. is not happy about that, no. and Grant agrees. Because um, their attitude is that they, is those are United States soldiers. Right. Not black soldiers. They're United States soldiers. Exactly. You give them back. You give them back. We're we're gonna treat exchange. them like you would a white soldier. Right. We're gonna exchange, and we want them back. That yep. sort of thing. They're not going back into slavery. They're not being killed for servile insurrection. They are United States soldiers, and we wish to exchange them for your POWs. Right. Now, um, as you guys know, the the exchange system is reestablished um, later in the war, late 64, but it's really never to the same extent that it was. And mm-hmm. we will have tragedies such as Elmira, Andersonville, um, Camp Asylum, things like that happening because there is now such a buildup of, of course, um, all the prisons that are right there around uh, Richmond as well. Mm-hmm. And we will have those tragedies of men wasting away in these facilities because they were never meant to hold that many people for that long. Yeah. And, of course, the Confederacy is struggling to feed its own forces, let alone feed thousands of POWs. Right, right. Now, this last one for 1862 I thought was pretty interesting because now we're starting to get into the food again. Mm Mm-hmm. That's what I like. (laughs) This comes from Colonel Charles S. Wainwright, Chief of Artillery, 1st Corps, Army of the Potomac, on November 27, 1862. He's down in Brooks Station, Virginia. This Thanksgiving Day, 
in all the loyal states here in camp, <clears throat> excuse me, this is Thanksgiving Day in all the loyal states. Here in camp, it cannot be more observed, especially as we are having a heavy rain. We determined, though, a week ago to have a good dinner, if such could be got, and gave Major Sanderson carte blanche for our headquarters, so he can do whatever he needs to do to make this dinner happen. The Major came fully up to his reputation as a caterer and set out a really excellent dinner when one considers our situation and and destitution of proper cooking arrangements. And then he lists the bill of fare. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. And I thought, um, I don't have a real good background in cooking and the names of cooking. I thought you might enjoy reading this one. Okay. Okay. So just start there at bill of why? fare. Are there a bunch of French words? There are that several, why? Of course. and I would butcher them. Okay. <clears throat> Fresh oysters not on the shell. Green turtle soup. A la tin can. A la can. tin. Oh, a la tin can. Okay. <laughs> Leg of mutton cut in capers. Mm -hmm. Roast turkey a la hardtack and cranberry sauce. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're inventive. Sweet potatoes au cendre. I don't know if that's how you pronounce that. I don't know either. Haricots? Harico. Harico? H-A-R-I-C-O-T-S? I'm not familiar with it. That's why I passed it off. Harico. <laughs> oh, you bastard. Oh, look at this. <laughs> look at this. All right. I'm going to try my best here. I don't I don't know French from uh, my hole in the ground. All right. Harico farci au vent. Riz. It's probably rice. Riz. Rice? Just rice? No, oh, you that, speak French, don't you? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's see how I do, and then you read it. I was going to say, hell, if we have the New Jersey jackass trying to read French and he speaks it. I didn't know Owen spoke it. Give it to him. Wait, hold on. I want to see. I want to see how bad I do. All right, so Harico, Farsi, Avon, Rice, this is boring, a la Dixie, Pomme de Terre, a la Smosh, or Smash, and then Canvas Back Ducks. Offer don't fall. God damn. <laughs> and a uh, currant jelly. Or is it currant? It's current. Current. Current, yeah. thank you. Lobster salad. There that is again. Lobster salad. It keeps coming up. Rather doubtful. <laughs> Lobster salad, rather doubtful. Mince pies. A la sauce de palms. Applesauce. Uh pumpkin pies, a uh, New England rum. Almonds, no raisins, apples, ginger, hot in the mouth. Yes, it is. <laughs> Fruitcake, coffee, and whiskey from A Diary of Battle. Now, Aaron, uh, Owen, read it in French. Holy hell. Okay. Herico farci Into the microphone. Okay. Uh, her Herico farci au vin riz à la Dixie. Uh, that's like beans. Just, just read it. Don't translate it. Pomme de terre à la smash. Uh, food en fer. Uh, I was uh, close. Uh, okay. uh, a la sens de bomb. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot there, Matt. No, and I didn't know you spoke no, no, French. No, no, no. I don't mind having done fun it. with it. Yeah. And I'm yeah. the one who cooks. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's funny when you have people who don't know it. Do, what do those mean? <laughs> well, Harry Co. is beans. No, of course. It's just green beans. Yeah. Green okay. beans. Uh, oh, Reese. It's rice. And rice. That was like meat pies with applesauce. Okay. Hmm. And potatoes. What does. Faris al vents mean is that a way of preparing it? Um, so yeah, that is. I don't. I don't <coughs> oh, it's oh, hang on, hang on. Farsi <laughs> Let's take a let's take a gander at that right right quick. Where are we looking? Uh, Where are we looking? Look under bill, oh, of, here we bill go. of fare. It's something of the <clears throat> vents. Farsi um, It is. It's like. It's like stuffing. Oh, right. really? So, uh, like in English, Butthole. it would just be farce, right? Which kind of developed into a, like a force meat pie, which is an English thing. We don't have it here, but you're essentially stuffing it. Oh. All volumes there you go. in the vent. Or See, of, yeah. the vent. of the vent. So you're stuffing it up the... Of the vent. Of the I, turkey's I vent. <laughs> stuffing it up your vent. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I'm going to get it on the clapping. <laughs> well, that was good, gentlemen. A nice group effort. Thank you for that. Took four weirdos in a shed to translate what all that shit means. <laughs> hey, that's all right. Je me speaky Frenchy. <laughs> Thank God Owen was here for the pronunciation. There you go. Well, and as Matt said, that comes from A Diary of Battle, uh, Colonel Charles Wainwright's 
efforts during the war, which is another great read. He's got a lot of opinions about a lot of people. Um, moving into 1863, Brigadier General Elpheus Williams, one of my favorite guys sure. to read about. Uh, First Division, 12th Corps, Army of the Cumberland by this mm-hmm. point. This is actually to one of his daughters on December 8th, 1863 in Tullahoma, Tennessee. So my day was used up and I did nothing except in the quiet of the evening, sat before my fire and thought of absent friends. He's referring to what he did on Thanksgiving. Of course, the good things and the good company at Uncle's had a prominent place in my uh, reveries. Um, Our anticipated feast of good things was delayed, almost lost by a very mysterious disappearance of our cook. It was nearly 8 p.m. before we got anything to eat. And he Mm. goes on to talk about how his cook got on a train and, like, was gone for a week. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Let's see. This comes from From the Cannon's Mouth, which is a collection of letters to his daughters. Uh, Again, Brigadier General Elpheus Williams. Now, that's the top or near the top of the pecking order. Let's drop it back down to the men in the ranks. This actually comes from Private John Haley, 17th Maine Infantry, on November 24th, 1862 or excuse me, 1863, I uh, actually miswrote that, in Falmouth, Virginia. While our friends at home suffer through uh, suffer through roast turkey, mince pies, and plum pudding, we cram ourselves on air pudding. At night, we drew some fresh beef, which was put through the smoking process and devoured. This didn't satisfy our appetites and only set them clamoring for more. Huh. Uh, this comes from the Rebel Yell in Yankee Hurrah, and he goes on to actually talk about how guys were stripping sinews and things like this from the uh, beef that had been cut up just to try to get anything else, mm. uh, any more sustenance, and how it was really un- unappetizing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sounds horrifying. Yeah. Now, Captain Alfred P. Rockwell of the 1st Connecticut Light Artillery wrote on November 25th, 1863, from Folly Island, South Carolina. Tomorrow, as you can see by the enclosed order, is Thanksgiving Day. So he's referencing uh, Lincoln's uh, proclamation there. Here as well as home. But alas, we have no turkey. I certainly have cause to be thankful. Need I say why most of all? And he's doing a little wink and a nod Mm -hmm. to, to his girl at home that he's writing to. The soldiers will have a holiday, but there is little amusement to be had here. And this, again, comes from that website, Spared and Shared is a really interesting collection. Now, we're going to touch on uh, the United States Sharpshooters again. Again, okay. First Sergeant Wyman S. White, 2nd U.S. Sharpshooters, on, in November of 1864 before Petersburg, and he did not specify what day uh, this was. It's close to Thanksgiving, though, because it says, I received a box from home about a week before Thanksgiving with some good things to eat and a big hat and a pair of calfskin boots that were made to measure by a shoemaker in my hometown. Also, some mittens and stockings that my mother knit for me. And this, of course, comes from Civil War Diary of Wyman S. White. So, so food and gifts and, and other things yep, to it's help definitely keep them the comfortable. Season. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's the holiday season, and I wonder if it's if it's because you know the winter's coming on, and it makes you want to retreat, like into your home, into the warmth of your home. Oh, I think you so. You want to cuddle up with someone by a fire and just be around people you love until you can't stand them in March and you can't wait for the spring to come so that you could all be out of the house and not see each other. And I wonder if that's that's why we, we, we tend to like be giving in this time of the year and we are more thankful and everything because we're about to go into hibernation, so to speak. And it's just like, we're not going to do anything for the next six months. So <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> batten down the hatches. Yeah, hope you're comfy. Let's look back on this past year and right. try to be thankful for it and hope that next year is going to be good. Even better. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Now. I didn't have a ton of quotes. Uh, actually, excuse me. I had. A, I did have a ton of quotes out of 64. Excuse me. I almost misspoke there. Just pick the highlights, the best ones. Okay. Give me the best ones. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, we'll do this one here. This was interesting because we're starting to see how the war is really grinding on the guys. All right. Um, again, Corporal John Haley, 17th Maine, November 24th, 1864, Petersburg, Virginia. 
This day has been set apart by the president as a day of, quote, thanksgiving and praise. If anybody can tell me any occasion for gratitude or praise, I shall greatly be indebted to them. Since the reoccurrence of this festive occasion one year ago, many changes, changes have taken place. Many familiar faces have passed away. Many voices have been hushed, their lives sacrificed. As for me, I momentarily expect death or some calamity in which this horrid war abounds. I am thankful that the days of slavery are ended. I hope the next Thanksgiving will find me safely at home. Huh. And again, my God, how did you get a hold of my war journals? <laughs> 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 I was going to say, man, imagine like living like that every day with that way of thinking. But then here's Eric. And he did live that way, right, Eric? You still do, you always say. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, I wait for death momentarily. <laughs> So depressing. <laughs> and again, this comes from the Rebel I Yell and Yankee Hurrah. No, but I think that's a very... Um, these are guys who've gone through it. They're very used to... As much as it's terrible and they recognize it as terrible, they are used to the calamities and the sporadic nature of war. This yeah. could happen at any moment. Yeah, you could be out any time. Right. Yeah. Especially there in front of Petersburg when it's a sharpshooter, right. um, a random cannon shot, any any number of things could have taken them out at that point. So, mm. no, I, I, I get that grim. Oh, sure. I appreciate, though, that. He is still looking to the future to some extent. For sure. And he recognizes the really some of the driving forces or the driving force behind the war, slavery. Yeah. And the ending of slavery. He's thankful for that. So yep. that's great. Now, and again, I don't want to necessarily go through all of these. <coughs> Let's, Let's pick a this. random one. Yeah. This actually is from uh, a slightly different front. We've had a couple there from Petersburg, so let's look at the Richmond front. Uh, this is, comes from Colonel Alfred P. Rockwell, 6th, 6th Connecticut Infantry, November 27, 1864, before <laughs> Richmond, Virginia. Thanksgiving Day, I dined with my cavalry friends, and he's referring to the 4th Massachusetts, and had turkey, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Colonel Rand came up from Deep Bottom, and we had a pleasant time. So the fighting around uh, first, second, Deep Bottom, all that good stuff. He goes home for 30 days. I told him I did not particularly envy him unless he were to remain. Mm. Okay, so, uh, and Eric, we've hmm. touched on this in, in the past with some of the other holiday episodes. These guys, even shunning the idea of going home because they they know they're going to have to come back again. Mm. That's what he's talking mm. about right mm -hmm. there. Yeah. 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 It sucks. <laughs> I I could imagine that does suck. Mm -hmm. You you miss home, you miss home, you get to go home, and you don't want to go back to that hell. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So it's better to just stay in the hell. Mm -hmm. I get it. I used to try to put it off for as long as possible. Yeah. I remember you like mentioned my, that. I, like my second deployment, I waited 11 months before I went on R&R. &R. Wow. And then, like and then, by design. How long were you home Fifth, for? Uh, three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah. 11 three weeks. months and you get three weeks. And then how hard was it to go back? Oh, my God. It was hell. Yeah. Those last four was. months took forever. I bet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's kind of why when I lived in Jersey, I never, I rarely visited here mm -hmm. because I love it here. And New Jersey is hell. That was my war. Thank you. <laughs> and, and so I would, uh, I would not come here because leaving was hard. Leaving was hard to go back to New Jersey, back to my Home, my war front, my front lines. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm trying to do any stolen valor here, but uh, so I can sorry. relate. I'm so sorry you were born in New Jersey. <laughs> I am too. I am too. Well, and I think it's even not looking at the extremes of fighting a war and, and getting to step away from it and then having to go back to said war. And, yes. we, and we hear similar um announcements and, and statements by soldiers throughout American military history. Right. Okay. Um, but think about it, just, just the situation you had. You love Gettysburg. You didn't like to leave Gettysburg. And I think even during the holiday season, many of us feel that way. Many of us, not everybody, feels that way about going home. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, yeah, I mean, I don't, honestly, I don't I know like you're not a home. huge fan of, uh, <laughs> of, of your home, but. I um, wish everybody would come here for, for the holidays. That would be a cool holiday. Yeah, it would be, but they don't want to do it. Mm. So I got to go to them. So I got I got two left for you um, <laughs> for 1864. Okay, go ahead. Um, 
And this actually is now, he's gone up in rank. This is Brevet, Brevet Brigadier General Charles S. Wainwright on November 24th, 1864. Again, the Petersburg Front. This is Thanksgiving Day, and he has that in quotes, all over the country. The president has appointed it as well as the government of the different states. Great preparations were made in New York City to supply all the soldiers with a turkey dinner, and the papers this week have been full of accounts of the cooking and packing. Unfortunately, it did not get down in time for the distribution this morning, though the cargoes arrived at City Point last night. Captain Steele tells, tells me that the proportions to this corps will be 14,000 pounds of turkey, 100 barrels of apples with cranberry sauce and pies in like quantity. Mm. As the officers are to get some as well as the men, Teamsters, hospitals, and all, the above amount will have to be divided among about 24,000, hmm. giving rather over half a pound of turkey, one apple, and a bite of pie to each. When bite these, of pie. A bite of pie to each. When these things are done, it would be much better to confine it to one article and plenty of that. So he's saying, look, instead of spreading the love across everybody, let's... let's concentrate on one thing and and you're going to get a lot of that okay yeah so and, what like so you mean everybody got all one thing or it would be like this many men would all get turkey and this many women would all get pie that's and, what like, i interpreted okay. it as did you, did you ever come across uh leander stillwell talking about thanksgiving Stillwell, we've talked about before, but yeah. I wasn't able to find. Still, I, he's he's very bitter. Yeah. <laughs> so I, Can you I, find I, it? I did you? Yeah, find I have it right here. Read, Go it, for it. read it to us. And, and he's actually writing in a letter to his father about Christmas, but mm -hmm. he references Thanksgiving in here. Throws a little jab at Thanksgiving. Yeah, I think, uh, I said, think we may have touched on this. Yeah. When Christmas morning came, I was feeling awful blue. In spite of all I could do, I couldn't help but think about the good dinner you folks at home would have that day, mm. and I pictured it all out right. in my imagination. Then about every one of the boys had something to say about what he would have for Christmas dinner if he was home, and they'd run over the list of good things till it was almost enough to make one go crazy. To make matters worse, just the day before in an old camp, I had found some tattered fragments of a New York Illustrated newspaper with a whole lot of pictures about Thanksgiving Day in the Army of the Potomac. Oh, yes. Yeah. They were shown as sitting around piles of roast turkeys, pumpkin pies, pound cake, and good goodness knows what else, and I took it for granted that they would have the same kind of fodder today. You see, the men in that army, by means of their railroads, are only a few hours from home, mm -hmm. and Old Forest is not in their neighborhood. So it is an easy thing for them to have good times. And here we were, away down in Tennessee, in the mud and the cold, no tents, no on quarter rations, and picking scraps of hard tack out of the mud and yep. eating them. It was enough to make a preacher swear. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I remember we did yes. touch did on that. Did we talk about that? That was on the Christmas, Christmas one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But what? But that's a good one that you pulled yeah, up there. It's a great though. one. Because, I mean, that's... Thanks, Eric. Th yeah. Just think about that now. You know the other guys on your team are having the life of Riley, and you're in that miserable... <laughs> good reference. Thank you. You're, and you're in that miserable... Uh, it's better than me saying the life of Brian. <laughs> Uh, hell, you know, in the mud, and you're picking out. It, you, you're on a, what is it? Quarter rations? Quarter they were rations. on quarter, quarter, quarter rations. rations. Yeah. These boys up north, they're getting turkeys and canned food, and you got Boxes quarter rations and no tents. Did you say no tents too, Eric? It says no tents. No yep. tents in the mud. In, in the, the mud. Cold, in no the cold. tents on quarter rations. Ugh. Picking scraps of hardtack out of the mud. It's a wonder. That's everybody, in Tennessee, right, Eric? Yeah, yeah. he's yeah. in Tennessee. It's a wonder everybody didn't just say f this and go home all at once. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of them did, but yeah. not all at once. I would have. Uh, the the last one I have for you here comes from November 23rd, 1864 in Milledgeville, Georgia. Okay. So this is with Georgia. Sherman's boys. All right, okay. here we go. Sergeant Rice C. Bull, 123rd Rice New York. Bull. That's Rice a good Bull. name. Yep, 123rd New York Infantry. We thought we had had much to be thankful for. The fact that we are here alive was ample cause, and we, <clears throat> excuse me, and and had we not just covered a hundred miles of the enemy's country with not a gun being fired by our left wing, meaning his chunk of Sherman's march. Further, were we not in possession of the capital of Georgia? So they've got something to be thankful sure. for. Now he's going to get into the food. Early in the morning, 10 of us bunched, to, uh, bunched our food holdings for dinner. We had several hens, a goose, some fresh pork, a bag of wheat flour, and coffee. 
Now, prior to this quote, he had talked about how the bummers had just been mm-hmm. coming in with all of the these items that they'd taken from the countryside and they're going to take this bundle of food that they have here and go pay a local um, african-american lady who they keep referring to as auntie to cook it for them okay and they talk about loving to just stand around near the cabin as the food's cooking and getting all the smells and then paying her two dollars to cook this basically all-day meal for them and then they go off on it Um, they stuff themselves silly and then leave her the food that they couldn't eat so it's uh, that was nice of them it it is and it's an an interesting way to compare how the various armies and campaigns are going through this national holiday especially as the war progresses there is nothing like smelling the house when dinner is being cooked i agree right that that beautiful turkey smell well and supposedly smell Mm. is one of their strongest attachments to memory too yes yeah Oh, well, that's true. Onions. I mean, mm. oh, yeah, that's onions, another yeah. good one. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. I, was, I just think my grandmother's stuffing she used to make. Thank God my mother learned the recipe before she died. Uh, because Poor my grandmother died. Because she, she used to put sausage in it. And you, she would do some as actual stuffing and then some as dressing. Of course, the stuffing was almost better because mm. it had like all the turkey juice in it. You right. know. But then she would put strips of bacon over the top of the turkey. So then, oh, that, oh, that's interesting. Have you ever had that? Not a big, uh, not a big wrapping things in bacon fan. Agree. Also, not a turkey fan, if I'm honest. I can make a damn Disagree. good turkey. We are, we are. I, and that's fair. <laughs> like I'll, I'll eat it, but I don't prefer the texture of turkey. If As I'm opposed honest. to what? Chicken. Uh, it's the same thing to me. No. Oh, I, I wouldn't turkey's, go that far. I, turkey's really? much yeah. stringier. Yeah. Yeah. Really, it I can also it can also be does. a lot drier. Oh, too. definitely yeah, drier. Yeah, yeah, but that's I think because people don't know how to cook it. Right. Yeah. Uh, no, but uh, anyone who doesn't like uh, turkey or bacon or turkey and bacon is a communist and don't deserve wow. human rights well, and don't deserve human call rights. Me call I've, Mark. N- I've, <laughs> I've never heard of putting bacon on a turkey before. Maybe I you're like the bacon. I love bacon. I just don't <laughs> enjoy wrapping everything in bacon. Oh, well, you don't not... have to wrap it. You could just take a bite of the other thing and then take a bite of the bacon. As long as they're in your mouth together dancing. I like my bacon nice and crispy. Yes. yes. And that's I, how it gets when I you put enjoy, it on top of a turkey, by the I way. I enjoy my poultry skin to be nice and crispy. Absolutely. And the two, I, they don't marry up to There's not, that, that is, that is, there is nothing better than crispy poultry skin. I don't care if it's chicken oh, or turkey, duck. duck. Oh, man. Oh. It, if it's duck done foul, right. But still. If it's done right. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, it is yes. foul. Yes. A, a bird. It's a bird. Bird, yeah. bird so skin. Foul. The, the avian creatures. <laughs> there we go. No, I, I agree. That is, uh, that is, I mean, I'm actually looking forward to Thanksgiving again now because of this. Look at you go. I never do these shows on an empty stomach. Getting also all excited. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm learning today because. Well, that is what I have for you today. So oh, I'm glad we've you, gotten you re-engaged and excited about Thanksgiving. You did. You did. You actually made me realize, uh, you know, I never really cared about Thanksgiving that much because it was like, you don't get presents, you know? So who cares? <laughs> right? Yeah. Thank you, Owen. I'm going to go home and roast a chicken. There you go. Oh, see, now uh, roast chicken. Are you, you, Chickens are good. Chickens I can't. I'm not going to get in the argument turkey over chicken. I love them both. I don't love one more than the other. That's fine. I love them both. I think they're both delicious. People, people do came enjoy first. Both. May I? May I remind you? Royal Farms is one of my favorite places oh, yeah, to go. Absolutely. And yeah. it's a gas station with chicken. Fine uh, fried chicken. Oh, oh very God, fine. Yes. Mm. <laughs> Folks, if you ever get to near a Royal Farm, stop, do a U-turn, whatever. Go there and get the chicken. You'll, you'll thank me. Get the chicken. Yeah. They're only in, like, what, this, this area in Maryland? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I would I would charge them, like, a reasonable rate, but then I'd, I'd say, here but then eat. give me half of that in chicken. I would sit here and eat a bucket of chicken every episode. <laughs> As a yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, on camera, just sit here <laughs> like some morbidly obese, disgusting human being. Yep, <laughs> shoving, shoveling fried chicken into my mouth. It's Veronica's news, brought to you by Royal Farms, and here's Veronica with a chicken tender. Remember when break. TVs used to have that picture-in-picture picture function? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, we could do that, where the picture in the picture is, is you me eating <laughs> eating Royal Farms. I love that. Just mowing down on. Can we? Can we just do that anyway? 
the bucket on like, a I mean, we stick. can, but yeah. you got to like keep feeding me chicken. Well, I'll just get you like a whole That's bunch fine. of chicken, and That's we'll just fine. stick a camera in front of you and just yeah, sit absolutely. there. Absolutely, I'll do that. Put the bucket on a pedestal. We'll so play I'll, it on I'll a loop. leave like I'll leave like the little <laughs> bits of uh, of breading in my beard and everything. We're doing that on Sunday. Okay. Uh, cancel your plans. That's what we're doing. <laughs> Oh, that's you fun. heard it here first. Oh, I can't wait to see. That. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoy this. I hope you learned something, of course. And uh, Matt, thank you very much for your due diligence this entire year, uh, doing all these uh, holiday shows. It's been my pleasure, Matt. Thank yeah. you for having me. I, I really do enjoy coming on here and, and sharing this. So. Oh, we we like having you, and I know the listeners like it when you're on because I see the comments, I get the emails, and uh, so far I haven't heard one bad thing about you. Wow. Okay. Plenty well, of bad things that. about me, <laughs> but not about you and Owen. A lot of bad things about Owen. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, <laughs> Owen. Well, they just they, they don't think you're a confident enough clapper yet. So. Ah. No, it's too late. It's, yeah, it's, it's too, too late. late. Okay. They're going to cut that one out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, seriously, thank you very much for doing that, Matt. And then also, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, what we might do for the next year, because I think uh, what we were talking about last mm-hmm. time after yep, the... we'll keep discussing uh, that. I think that would be very interesting to people. Good. And very then good. the following year, <laughs> we do the other guys. Oh. Oh. Now that would be interesting. That would be. Okay. Yes. Because, mm. you know, can't have one without the other. Anyway, folks, thank you very much for listening. We hope you have a very happy Thanksgiving. And uh, hey, uh, may I say, we are very thankful for all of you. Uh, that we are. He did it. Even the freeloaders. Yeah. The patrons. I'll clap to that one. All of you guys, our sponsors. Thank you very much. You've made it a great year for us, a fantastic year. And uh, we can't thank you enough. And I, and I know I always say that but it really is true we really cannot thank you enough so thank you good night au revoir there you go you got the last fucking french word in there didn't you i did had to be done <laughs>